Good morning. My name is Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here at Hope. It's fun to have all of you 9 a.m.ers in the same building. It's kind of fun. Kind of fun to see you all in one place. Um, I, I, I want to go back in time to my freshman year of high school. Some of you don't realize this. I, I went to Moundsview High School, and I was... <laughs> Mustangs forever. Uh, <laughs> so... So I, I was, a lot, a lot of you know I was more of an athlete uh, than maybe anything else. Uh, you may not know that I was quite the thespian. That's uh, acting for those of you not in the drama circles. Um, I, I actually tried out my freshman year of high school, I tried out for the school play. And this was so out of character. I, I, there was nothing really in my history that would like lend itself to dramatic portrayals. But I was, uh, I tried out for Godspell. This was, the, this was the spring play that we were doing at our school. And I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know the story. I don't know what Godspell is. It turns out it's about the book of Matthew. But for me, I didn't know what the book of Matthew was. So it didn't help to know that this was actually a take on Jesus' life as portrayed in the, in the book of Matthew in our Bible. I, di- I didn't know that. I, I grew up in a church going home, but I wasn't in a Christian home. I didn't have good metrics and, and rubrics, and, and I didn't have the Bible. I didn't, I didn't know these stories. And so I, I auditioned, and this is, I don't even know if I should share. No lie. So you have to, you have to try out. You don't, they don't just put any schmuck up on stage. So I had to, I had to try out for this thing. And as part of the trial, you have to sing Pu- publicly on stage by yourself, like not as part of a group. And I had never done this. Many of you know, especially uh, Brendan, who I work with here at Hope, he knows that I just hate, I hate singing. There's actually times where I forget to turn off my mic at like weddings and we'll be like singing songs and then I'll panic and like look back at him like, and he'll, and he'll like, I, I turned you down, I turned you off. <laughs> um, but it kind of freaks me out, this idea of singing on stage. And would you know it? They call my name first in the audition. And so I go, you know, knees wobbling, kind of get up there on stage. And I, 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 don't, know, I don't know what to sing. Now, what's the, what's the song that I should have sang? The song that we sing, you know, maybe twice a month. We do it at gatherings. We put a cake in the middle and we light the candle. I mean... Happy birthday was the song sung by half the people that would follow me that day. But it it escapes me. I know very few, if any, songs, and I'm just grabbing onto like, what what could I sing? What should I sing? I I I don't listen to music. So when we're in the car, I just, you know, my mom's driving me around, we listen to whatever she wants, I don't care about music. So the only song I know any number of lyrics to is. The Rose. <laughs> Some of you don't know this song. It's from like the Light FM. Like that's where you would find this song because that's what my mom listened to. And so I per- proceed to sing this Bette Midler tune. <laughs> like, I, I don't remember how it goes. Uh, Something about a hunger, endless aching need, and I, I sing this. And they let me in the play. I, that's unbelievable. But he, listen to this. I score. I score a part. I score. So there's this story about kind of the, the sower spreading seeds, right? And then, and then some fall along the rocks, and, and, and that seed shoots up. But because it doesn't have any root, then it collapses. And so that was, that was, I got to play that role. Seed fallen amongst the rocks. That was me. And so like I, I in the play, I had to reach and just reach because I was growing so high. And then I just threw myself on the ground, nailed my elbow, you know. And that was, that was my role. Now, now it's kind of interesting because, again, I don't know that this is the story about, about Christ. I don't, I don't have that background And it was only later that I come to piece all these together. But even back then, even as I'm doing this play, it's remarkable because I know something has happened, like something significant. This Jesus figure played by John Buck, one of of the seniors, right? Okay, he's 
he has asked Superman. He's, he's Jesus in this play, and he dies. And there was something, even back then, that I go, that's, that's remarkable. There's something about that, even back then, that kind of pierced me. It, it, it gripped me. And I hope, I hope that as we approach this Christmas season, this Christmas holiday, that there be something, something that grips you. Some of us have been walking with Christ for a long, long time. It becomes kind of stale, just wrote, oh, yeah, yeah. It's that season again. And I hope even today that it might be that. We're going we're gonna to look at John the Baptist, and, and <laughs> there's one song in Godspell that kind of captures John the Baptist's message. Do you guys know this one? Uh, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The lyrics go like this. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye over and over and over again. It's just the same thing. And then after John the Baptist, you know, actor gets done, then everybody responds. And that's, that's it. I mean, not much for originality there. Um, but that's what we're going to look at today. We're in the Gospel of Luke. For those of you who are new with us, just passing through, you're here with your family and friends because of Thanksgiving. Uh, welcome. We're, uh, we're in the part of the, the Gospel of Luke that's very early. We're just setting the stage for what's to come. We're in the first chapter, and it's like 24 chapters long. So we're just setting the stage, getting all of the scenery set, getting the main players involved. And, and we're about to launch into this, you know, year and a half, two year long journey looking at the life and ministry and teachings, miracles, death and resurrection of Jesus. But right now, we're still in the developing stage of which John the Baptist is a forerunner to so much of what's going to happen here it's a new dawn. A new dawn is breaking. John the Baptist, one of our main uh, figureheads for today, is kind of a part of that new dawn coming. Um, but this is wrapped up in Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're his parents. And they get some wonderful news as Zechariah goes in and, and presents some worship. He's, he's a, uh, a lead priest at that time, kind of presents. He, he has an angelic encounter. And that angel tells him some things about this this boy that's going to be born to them. Even though he and his wife seem to be beyond childbearing years, God's going to do something fantastic. And she who thought was thought to be barren is, is going to give birth to the son. And this son is going to be great and do amazing things, is what he is told. And that's where we kind of pick up our narrative, the, the story within Luke's gospel today. We're going to look at the birth of John the Baptist we're going to look at this story, and we're actually going to use one of the questions at the end of the passage to launch off into kind of two forks in this road of John's uh, ministry and preaching. We're going to kind of jump into, forward into a story, even though he's just born today in our, in our account today. We're going to look ahead. How is it? What's so significant about this kid, about this baby? And then I want to end by just asking us some questions about what, what does that mean for us? What does it look like this Christmas season? What would it might look like as, as we see John the Baptist kind of prepare the way for the Lord? What does that look like this Christmas season, this holiday for us? You know, the, as, the, as the song goes, prepare him room. What would it look like to, to prepare a way that this would be, might, might be a very um, pivotal, enjoyable, worshipful uh, Christmas holiday? So let's, let's read through it and then we'll, we'll make some comments. Beginning in verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, People were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. So that's our passage for today. I want to just walk through it now, a little bit at a time, make some comments, and just while, while I'm doing this, just be asking, God, is there anything you want to show me today? Is there anything you want to share with me? Because ultimately, 
The point is not just to get you here. The point is to connect us to God. And, and we do that a number of different ways at Hope. We do that through small groups. We do that through a number of different events. We're going to have a Christmas party. We're going to hang out. We can do a lot of fellowship here at Hope community, trying to do life uh, on life. But just even singing these songs today. I so appreciate what our band does, but they're here not just so that we actually sing, but that we sing in a way that connects us to God. And hopefully his word will connect us to him as well. So let's look at this together, making some comments. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. It's kind of like a duh. You read the first part before the comment? Like, when it was time for her to have her baby, she does. Like, uh, okay. But the interesting point is, if this is a story about John the Baptist and his birth, that would seem to indicate the climax of the story is what? When he's born. But here in the first verse, we already have like, okay, she gives birth to a son. And it should indicate to us, this ain't the main point of this passage here, just that he's born. It's great, it's significant, but there's more to come. It says, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. What is significant, as we've already noted, if you've been with us for the past few weeks, is that some circumstances, right? They were childless. Again, why? <laughs> What does that mean? Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Not only that, not only is she childless, not able to conceive, look how in a different section of chapter one, this is portrayed. It says, uh, behold, your relatives, the, the angel's talking with Mary here, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. It's interesting that scripture portrays it that way. She's called what? Barren. That's how she's known. That's how she's named. That's how she's called. She's barren. And so it's no small thing that she is pregnant and that she gives birth to a son. She was barren for a number of years and she was called barren. And so you would think, all right, given her barrenness, given the angelic vision that uh, uh, the, the father, Zechariah, has with the angel, and, and all the things that the angel communicates about John the Baptist, that he's going to be great and he's going to do all these things, you would think the birth would be the climax, that that would be it, that that would be the point of the story. Why? Because he's going to be great before the Lord. It's like, well, case closed. Let's, let's go celebrate. Let's get some Don Pablos. I don't know why I said that, but uh, I like, I work there. Uh, I recommend it. Let's keep going. Her neighbors, right, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. It's interesting, this idea that her neighbors and relatives heard about this. Why, why is that significant? Well, we see in verse 24 that it says, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. What's that about? Like, I, I, I see, you know, as I'm going through my Facebook news feed and I'm getting all the pertinent updates of your all lives, um, I get these unique, creative ways of demonstrating, like, hey, we're pregnant. Elizabeth doesn't do that. She remains in seclusion. And we don't know. Commentators disagree and debate. Why is it? Why seclusion? There's nothing in kind of Judaic or, or Israelite history that would indicate, like, hey, do this. There's nothing in the law that says remain in seclusion. And so they speculate about, why is this? Is it just for fear that she might lose the child? Was that, you know, possible that she had miscarriages and so she's just worried until delivery's gonna happen? Could be, maybe, we don't know. But it's interesting that she remains in seclusion. Even in the passage I just read about uh, Mary, Mary gets the news from the angel that Elizabeth is in her sixth month. So she, even a, even a relative hadn't heard at that point, when Elizabeth is in her sixth month, that she's even pregnant. So it's this unique deal. So they're hearing about this. Her neighbors and relatives are hearing about this at a later date than normal. And then she says this, the Lord had shown her great mercy. Their relatives, their neighbors, realize, see that the Lord had shown her great mercy. The Lord had done this for me. In another place, Elizabeth says, in these days, God has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Taken my reproach away, as some of your translations might say. And I want to land there for just a moment and address something which I know in the church, 
is a very challenging thing, and that's infertility. Some of you right now are struggling. That's, that's where you're at. And it feels like a reproach. It feels like a disgrace. It feels like what Elizabeth must have been experiencing. For how long? Years. She's, at the time that the angel meets Zechariah, she's past what they believe is childbearing, period. So at the least, that's been 15 years, 20, 25, 30, 35 years, possibly, of praying, hoping, Desiring, wanting. I feel for Zechariah. There's times where, you know, as a pastor, we pray. and I'm the one who should know a little bit more and, and pray and it doesn't happen. There's no answer to that prayer. I, I can feel that, that struggle. I identify with this story. Some of you know this. You know this pain. You know what she's going through there. This word in Greek is onidos. It's nothing you need to know. It's just ill fame, reproach, disgrace. It refers to sterility or infertility. In Genesis 30, 23, um, if you remember the story, Rachel's sister Leah has had six kids. And Rachel was still barren, still hadn't given, had any kids. And then she finally does. She names her kid Joseph, saying, the Lord has taken away my disgrace. And I think some of the, one of the hard things that's um, present in our Christian lives is when God doesn't make sense. When I feel like this is what we want, seems like it's in, kind of consistent with your will, God. See, every, it's happening to everybody else around me. In the church, we share birth announcements. And you come to hope and you actually come late because it's just too hard. I want to encourage you to share that with people that you trust, people you're close to. It sucks. And we want, we want hope to be a place where you can share that. Share those painful, confusing things. You can feel like the outsider in this case, in this circumstance. Don't want you to feel that. I want you to know that this is a place for you to be at home. Let me just now expand that from kind of the, the topic of infertility to whatever your thing might be. All of us has something, something that causes us to look upon ourselves and go, that's why I'm outside this group. That's why I'm outside God's reach and outside God's family. That's why I'm not a part of hope. That's why in my office, I'm kind of the, the, the one who sticks out. I'm the black sheep in my family. Each of us has something that we could slide into there and say, therefore, I bear disgrace, I bear reproach, therefore, I'm not acceptable to this people or to this God. It's not true. But what is it for you? What is the thing of which you just go, all right, I just need X, and then my reproach, my disgrace will be taken away? Because it may not happen. We're sharing a success story in the scriptures, but it may not happen. And yet the Bible's clear. God has given us everything, everything we need for life in him. I do pray and hope that he removes that obstacle. And yet I recognize and have prayed alongside people where that, that hasn't happened. Chiefly, this disgrace is removed at the cross. That's what unites us as a church. That symbol behind me on that wall shows that the greatest, the capital D disgrace has been removed forever. Let's keep going. And they shared her joy. And that is actually a fulfillment of a promise in, uh, earlier in Luke's gospel, 114 says, he would be a source of joy for many people, for all people. And so they share in her joy. Continuing on in our passage, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Now, this is in keeping with Jewish custom, the law that is put out in front of the Israelites. And so, being kind of a, a blameless, righteous priest and family, they follow this rule just as it's communicated in Genesis 17. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, 
and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. And so they do that. They do that for their son. And that's one of the two things that they are called to do. The other is to name the child. This doesn't happen, you know, maybe for some of you, you do it like within 24 hours of, uh, of the child being born. That's a little bit different here. They tend to do this on the eighth day. And so we see that happen here. They were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. This is the conflict in our story for today. This is it. Like, you would think naming the child would be pretty easy. You yield to dad and mom. But no, it says they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. And we have a more individualized culture that we we don't make decisions specifically. As we get older, we kind of, all right, let's let's exclude siblings. Let's exclude parents. I'm going to stand on my own two feet. I'm going to make my own decisions. You can give your input, but I'm going to do what I want. Okay? Here, it's just a different culture. It's much more common to make decisions within the family. And they're thinking, the, the thinking here is, God, poor Zechariah goes in, right, to kind of do his priestly duties, comes out. He can't speak. Some commentators even speculate he can't hear, that he is deaf and he's mute. And so you can see the family getting around like, hey, what should we do? It's been, it's been nine months. He's, he hasn't uttered a word in nine months. Like, maybe we could honor, like, best of intentions, right? Like, we could, we could honor Zechariah. We just call him, you know, Zechariah Jr., little Zeki, uh, going to come and follow in the footsteps of his dad, you know? Just call him Zechariah the second. Something to, to honor him, right? You can kind of imagine this family group huddle kind of coming to agreement. Like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, let's name him Zechariah. And she's, the mother speaks up. Elizabeth speaks up and says, no, he is to be called John. One, one commentator said, kind of paraphrased it, no, you don't. <laughs> or updated, no, you didn't. Like, you don't. <laughs> this, is, this is the mom's right and the dad's right. They get, she speaks up and says, he is to be called John. We don't know. Scripture's kind of silent here. Was this something that Zechariah communicated via some sort of tablet, right? Because he mute, can't speak. So is this something he wrote down? Is this something that... She received some other way. I I'm, I'm tend to think that he communicated. This is how it was going to go down. So he, uh, she communicates. No, he is to be called John. And their, their response is, hey, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Again, this isn't in our thinking. We choose names and we just go, well, why'd you choose that name? I don't know. I kind of liked it. Right? Or we had to rule out a lot of names because, uh, like, bad connotations. I don't know if any of you had that experience where you're just like, oh, yeah, like, what do you think, think about Will? It's like, oh, I knew a Will. Oh, no. No, I just, yeah, no, going back to high school, there's a guy, Will, and oh, it's just all sorts of bad news, so let's, I can't. You know, like, that's how we ruled out names at times. But for them, having a family name was important to who, uh, who they thought this kid would be. And so John was not in that line. And so this is stepping out of character for that custom. But then it also, I think, shows God's greater plan. This is not just a, a, a John, a person for you. There's, there's much greater plans that God has in place for him. Joel Green says this, The simplicity with which we expect the narration of such routine activity to proceed is interrupted by a struggle between Elizabeth and her neighbors and friends between apparent societal norms, okay, there it is. There's a societal norm that's happening, and obedience to the angel's words. Perhaps following the tradition in Genesis of naming children according to their significance, Elizabeth opposes her neighbors and relatives, insisting that the child would be called John, which means Yahweh, or God, has shown favor. And so in the Old Testament, we see this, right? We see uh, Jacob comes out, clasping his brother Esau's heel. And so that's how Jacob means. He grasps. And so this was common within the Old Testament that you would name a child based on significance. Similar thinking like, all right, the significance is, look what happened to his dad. Let's call him Zechariah. And, and obviously Elizabeth is opposing that. 
On the face of it, nothing unusual resides in the mother's having the leading role in the naming of her child. What we have before us to this juncture is the command of Gabriel to Zechariah that came earlier in chapter 1, raising the narrative possibility of the child's being named John, followed now by Elizabeth's independent witness to his name, raising that possibility to a probability, the opposition of the relatives and neighbors presents itself as an obstacle to Zechariah's obedience and raises the suspense of the narrative. Okay, so remember what happened. Go over to Zechariah. He's, uh, he's holy, he's blameless, he's righteous, he's carrying out his priestly duties. He meets the angel, has a moment of wavering, right? Like, no, this is going to happen. He goes, I'm not sure. How's that possible? All right, you're not going to speak, Zechariah. That's what the angel says to him. Okay, he had that moment uh, of, of disbelief. And now we have this new opportunity. What's going to happen to Zechariah in this moment? And that's where the story continues. They made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. So they make signs to his father. This is one of the phrases in our Bible that communicates, is he not just mute? Is he actually deaf? Because it it seems like it would be easy enough to just kind of have Elizabeth, you know, kind of reference like, Zechariah, hey, didn't we say his name was going to be John? And he just goes, It seems like, right? That seems the most natural running. So the fact that they were making signs to him, you know, what his name should be, seems to indicate maybe he wasn't just um, mute, but he was actually deaf. He couldn't couldn't hear anything. So he asked for a writing tablet, um, you know, some sort of iPad or something. um, And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote his name is John. And actually, it would have just been some sort of wax tablet. I'm sure he just... Put John down there, right? And everyone's astonished that, that both Elizabeth and Zechariah would confirm, no, his name is going to be John. And then where we had this kind of narrative suspense with Zechariah, he shows himself to be an ideal believer. He trusts God. He follows through. And then he is rewarded here. Oh, 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 hold on. Here we go. It says, immediately his mouth was opened. And his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And that's what said would happen, right? The angel said, okay, you're not going to be able to speak, but when this time comes, your mouth will be set free. You'll be able to speak. And he does. His mouth was open. His tongue set free. He began to speak, praising God. Let me go back and just quickly uh, take you through that narrative. It says, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Now you will be silent, not able to speak until when? The day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So he exercises faith, belief, no, his name is John. The angel and God respond and give him that healing that he's able to speak again. Let's keep going. All the neighbors, what's the response to all this happening, this story This identification of the name of John, the circumcision, this baby, all the neighbors were filled with awe throughout the hill country of Judea. People were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with them. And that last comment right there, the Lord's hand was with them, that seems to be like an editorial comment. Like Luke is taking his account, right? He's going to all the main players, all the minor major players, trying to get an orderly account of this thing. And one of the things that he's going to remember is like, no, the Lord's hand was with this guy. Something's different about this kid. Something's different about his life. And we get helped by uh, Robert Stein with this idea of the Lord's hand being with him. It says, hear the story of the childhood of the great pioneer of Christ, John, John the Baptist, is briefly sketched out. In it all and through it all, there was one guiding hand, the Lord's. The expression, hand of the Lord, was peculiarly a Hebrew thought, one of the vivid anthropomorphic idioms which, as has been aptly remarked, they could use more boldly than other nations because they had clearer thoughts of God as not made after the similitude of men, meaning similar to people. Rather, they had clearer thoughts that God's at work. And so his life, beginning, middle, end, it's about God. Testimony of God's work, God's power. I want to land with one um, on this question that was uttered there. 
What then is this child going to be? We know the end of the story. So we get a little bit of that. And that's where I want to go now. That's, that's his birth narrative. But what, is, what then is this child going to be, I think, holds um, a resonance for us. It, it's going to resonate. This, this idea of John the Baptist going forth, preparing a way for the Lord, that we might hear that message and respond accordingly this morning. I, I, I love some of the descriptions of John the Baptist, you know, eating locusts and honey and just got kind of this leather belt and sash and all this thing, just kind of like, in my mind, he's like this cross between like a lumberjack, and like a WWE wrestler somehow. <laughs> That's my picture of John the Baptist. We don't know, right? We don't have any uh, great uh, <laughs> pictures of him at the time. But what then is this child going to be? And the, he should have known, he should have known, this was the song written about him, he should have known what he was going to do, but he's here to prepare the way of the Lord. Another way of saying this is he's a forerunner. He's to go before uh, Jesus and prepare a way. So I, I came up with some analogies to help us with this. So if, if Jesus is like the Olympics, John the Baptist is like the opening ceremonies. Not great, but gets you excited, right? The opening ceremonies. I don't know. I might watch. I might not. Um, if Jesus is like the wedding, John the Baptist is like the the flower girl, can you imagine him? Just this <laughs> brood of a guy kind of throwing flowers. Um, if Jesus is the baseball game, uh, John the Baptist is like the ceremonial first pitch. If Jesus is like the politician being elected, then John the Baptist is like the campaign li lies? Uh, d no. <laughs> that, was, that was uncalled for. That if Jesus is like the egg, then John the Baptist is like the chicken, because the chicken comes before the egg, right? Where does the chicken come from? An egg, of course. I don't know what's, what's so confusing about that. Um, so John is a forerunner, and he's, this is captured very clearly for us in John chapter 3. I want to read this. It says, they came to John, and they said to him, teacher, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, referring to Jesus, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing, and everyone is going to him, right? You can just send some of his disciples like, hey, we thought you were the guy. You were the big deal. What's going on? To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, what did I say? I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the groom. The friend who attends the groom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the groom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. And that is John's, the mes John's message over and over and over again. Is Jesus must become greater. He's the big deal. He's the big show. I'm just a warm-up band here. I'm preparing a way for him to come and to move in power. And there's two ways that we see this in our Bibles. There's two ways that he becomes this forerunner, this one who goes before him. The first one is this. He preaches a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He preaches a baptism of repentance. Repentance just meaning turning. He preaches that people should turn. Mark 1, 4 and 5 says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So you can just imagine, right? There's, this guy is spoken about and then all of a sudden nothing really happens because he's growing up, he's growing in stature and then all of a sudden he starts his public ministry, he's out in the wilderness, he's at the Jordan, he's starting to baptize people, word is starting to spread. John's message is going viral, okay? People are starting to come to him and he's baptizing them. Not just people that don't know anything about God. All of a sudden, some of the religious people, the religious rulers, the Jews, start to come out to him. They make their way away from the city, away from the temple, away from Jerusalem, and go check out what's going on. What's his response to them? Matthew 3, 7 and 8 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he says this to them, You brood of vipers, you snakes, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, you guys should know this message. The message I'm preaching about turning from sin to God, you should know that. 
You have the covenant, the promises, you have circumcision, they don't have that. I'm telling them to turn from this, to repent of their sin and turn to God. You should know this already. Why are you coming out here? Who warned you about my message to flee coming wrath? What you should be doing is producing fruit in keeping with repentance. You should know this message. You should have this. This should be your message. You're Israel's teacher. You're the one who should know the Messiah is coming behind me. And I think it's a stern warning to us. If you've been coming to Hope more than six months, you're religious. You might not, not describe yourself. That's like one of those icky words like, no, no. I'm different than the religious people. I actually, you know, worship God and stuff. It's like, no, you're viewed as religious. And in many ways, we get very casual. It becomes so common. All of a sudden, repentance, it doesn't find its way into our vocabulary and into our lives. We just, we stop turning from sin. We just, no, 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 we're good. Why? Because I know the gospel. I know the cross. It's good. We don't have this habit. We're not in this pattern of contrition and confession and turning from sin. All of a sudden, the cross becomes an excuse. No, I can sin. It's like, no, it's not okay. And this is John's message. Like, no, no, no. The proper response to the coming of the kingdom of God is one of contrition and turning from sin. Turn from your ways. This is what Kent Hughes says. John's dress, John's lifestyle, John's message were a protest against the godlessness and self-serving materialism of his day, a call to separate oneself from the surrounding sinful culture to repent and to live a life focused upon God. What do you talk about at church? Good old repentance, you know? <laughs> that's the thing, that's that one of those icky words that sometimes gets brought up. Like, no, this is a part of God wanting to come and bring forth his gospel messages that we're confronted with our sin and our fallenness, that we have run away from God. And we are called to turn back So the first one is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The second role that John the Baptist had was to prepare the way for Jesus. John 1, 6 and 8 says, There was a man sent from God, that's John being referred to, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through that light all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Later on in that same passage, it says, so they said to him, who are you? John the Baptist, who are you? We need to go give an account to answer those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John the Baptist replies, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, I'm here to make a straight path so that it's clear that they can see the Lord, that they can walk this path. I make it discernible, understandable, that they can come to God in faith. We actually see this in Isaiah. Let's go back there. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There are several times, probably a handful of times in our Old Testament, where this idea of preparing a way, removing obstacles, making a road, is said about Israel. Many times, it's so that they can come back from exile, right? The Babylonians, the Assyrians, they come in and they they send uh, the Israelites away from Jerusalem, away from the, the promised land. And most of the time, these prophecies speak of them coming back from exile. Like, we need to remove obstacles of unbelief and a lack of repentance. Once you do that, we'll bring you back to the promised land. This is one that says, no, no, no. Make a way for who? Make a way for the Lord. A highway for our God. So it's not just about coming back to the promised land. It's a path coming back to God. John the Baptist prepares a way for the Lord to come back to us. Why? We've been running the opposite direction. What was supposed to be a straight path between us, we have made a maze. Because we've been running, doing off our own thing. 
says this in John 1. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was preaching one of repentance, turning away. How is that going to happen? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what makes Christmas so beautiful. That's what makes Christmas so special is our understanding of Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want to return back to God's spell. I can remember in that moment as the, as the play finished up, being one of the you know, four or five guys asked to carry this Jesus figure out of the auditorium. Again, I have no, no concept of why that happened. What was the need for that? I just, I just knew something about this was different. It was, it was remarkable. I just didn't know why. And some of you, maybe you've been attending church or churches. Maybe you've heard about the importance of Christmas, but you've just missed it. And you don't know why all the brouhaha about Christmas. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not that somehow, like in my mind, like, all right, I'm going to take Jesus and carry him. It's like, no, 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 Jesus carries me. Jesus carries my sin, takes it far, far from me. That I might have a straight path to experience life in God. Christ makes a way. Christ makes that straight path for you and me. Not just that we can come back from some other foreign land into the promised land, but that we can find our way back to God, that we actually have the opportunity to know him again. To be accepted back into the fold, as our song sang earlier. This is the gospel of God's grace. At Hope, we have the chance. We have the opportunity to do this daily. Some of you may get wearied, tired of just kind of like doing church life. Because in your mind, you're just like, oh, it's just one more night. It's just one more thing. The things you do, you small group leaders that open up your house, you prepare a way for the Lord. Those of you that hand up worship folders on Sundays, park cars, you prepare a way for the Lord. You who teach in Sunday school, Hold children in nurseries, you prepare a way for the Lord to come. We, that's our business. We get that opportunity. We get that chance to come to God and then we get to extend that to others. Hope was actually founded on a passage in Isaiah 57, verse 19. Prepare, build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. That's what we get to do as a church. We get to break down the different caricatures of Christianity. We get to present the gospel, share who Jesus really is, and expose them to the gospel of God's grace. So prepare the way of the Lord is something that we can chant, but it's also something we can call out to one another. You, me, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Ye is a second person plural. I'm not great with English grammar, but that means you all. Let's prepare you all, prepare a way for the Lord. We are called to this ministry. We are called to do this. So I have a couple questions to ask, a few questions to ask. We're going to bring the worship team up uh, for one more song here. Have you heard the message of repentance? I could have stayed there longer, but I know we got guests, we got family, (laughs) friends coming in, but it's like, no, we have to understand the bad news and the sin and the brokenness brokenness and the darkness. We need to hear that first, that we might recognize, okay, there's no life there. I need to turn. Turn to who? Turn to what? The gospel of God's grace. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Have you heard that? That's the message of Christmas. That's the message of Easter. That's why it's such a big deal. This is our salvation. This is the hope of the church. Then finally, this season, this Christmas season, in your sphere, I don't know if that's office, I don't know if that was roommates. 
know if that's classrooms, different classmates. Whatever your sphere is, are you someone that would want to bring a culture of preparing a way for the Lord? God's spell was that for me. My brother was that for me. A uh, 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 member of a, a parachurch ministry was that for me. Steve was that for me. A number of people that prepared the way of the Lord. So when the gospel actually came, the message came, it's like, I, I see it, I, I hear it, I believe that. You and I, we as the church get an opportunity. That's our joy to prepare a way for the Lord. Let's pray together.